whole century is quite interesting. If you take the 20th century, it was an unbelievable century for the United States. The GDP per capita, and that's the way to think of it as per capita. Sometimes they talk about our GDP versus Europe's, but if their population is the same every year and ours goes up 1%, you've got to, you know, in the end, you've got, you got to have a divisor as well as a numerator. And <clears throat> so GDP per capita in the 20th century in the United States went up 610%. Actually, qualitatively, it went up far more than that because you can't really measure you know, certain things uh, in medicine or whatever it may be uh, and improvements, but just on a quantitative basis. It went up every single decade, including the decade of the 30s. So here you had 100 years when basically the U.S. citizenry was getting, was improving their lot decade by decade by decade. The 30s, it was up 13%. Uh, best decade was World War II, the, 19, the 40s, it's up 36 percent. The worst decade was the First World War. So you get sometimes the analogy, you know, you can get in trouble on analogies. But in any event, it was a, it was a huge period. Interestingly enough, there were six big periods in there for the stock market in both directions. There were three big bull markets from 1900 to 1921. The Dow went from 66 to 71, less than a 10 percent move in 20 years less than half a percent a year. You got dividends too, but a half a percent. So it didn't move. From 21 to 29, as you point out, it went, it went from 71 to a high of 381 in September of 1929. Went up 500%. Well, obviously, the well-being of the country didn't go up 500% during that period. And the well-being of the company, <clears throat> country went up a whole lot more than 10% during that first 21 years. So you got this very uneven development. Then from, 19, from September of 1929, until the end of 1948, the Dow went from 381 to about 180. It was cut in half. And that was 18 long years. And yet, the per capita GDP was moving right up during this whole period, so the economy was doing fine. From 48 to 65, the Dow went, again, from about 180 up to close to 1,000. Again, five for one, which was far outstripping it. From 65 to 81, the Dow went down. Literally, well, again, per capita GDP. And then we've had this last period where it's gone up terrifically. If you take the whole 100 years, it went up 180 for one. Every $1,000 became 180,000. But 43 and a quarter years, 43 and three quarters years were those three big, huge bull markets, and 56 and a quarter years were periods of stagnation, all in an economy that was doing fine, you know, year after year after year. 56 and a quarter years, net the Dow was down a couple hundred points during that period, and the other 43 and three quarters years made up the rest of this move from 66 to 11,000, some on the Dow. So you say to yourself, how could it be that you could have a country that was doing better and better and better and better? Citizens were living, every, every generation was living better than the one that preceded it, but you had these huge changes big gains a few times, long periods of stagnation. 20 years, I mean, that's a long time to do nothing. The answer is that investors behave in very human ways, which is they get very excited during bull markets and they look in the rear view mirror and they say, I made money last year, I'm gonna make more money this year, so this time I'll borrow, you know, or, or the neighbor says, you know, I wasn't in last year when that neighbor was dumber than I, I made a lot of money, so I'm gonna go in this year. So they're always looking in the rear view mirror. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see a lot of money having been made in the last few years, they plow in and they just push and push and push on prices. And when they look in the rearview mirror and they see no money having been made, they just say, this is a lousy place to be. So they don't care what's going on in the underlying business. And it's, it's astounding, but that's, that makes for huge opportunity. Just huge opportunity. I mean, I've lived through roughly half, in an investing sense, about half that period. And I've had that long period of stagnation from 48, uh, I mean from 65 uh, to 82, 17 years. I wrote an article for Forbes in 1979. I just said, how can this be? Pension funds in, the, in 1970 put 100 and some percent of their new money in stock because they were wild about stocks. Then they got a lot cheaper and they put a record low in, 9% of their net new money in in 1978 when stocks were way cheaper. People behave very peculiarly in, in, in terms of their reactions because they 
they're human beings and they, they get excited when others get excited, they get greedy when others get greedy, they get fearful when others get fearful, and they'll continue to do so. And you will, you know, you will see things you won't believe in your lifetime and securities markets. And the country will do very well over time, but you will see these huge waves. And, and, and uh, if you can stay objective throughout that, if you can detach yourself temperamentally from the crowd, you get very rich. And you won't have to be, be very bright. I mean, it, uh, I'm sure you are, but, but uh, <laughs> you want, you know, it, just, it doesn't take brains. It takes temperament. It takes the ability to sit there and look at something. When I started out in 1950, I would go through and find things at two times earnings. And they were perfectly decent businesses. And people wanted jobs at those companies. And everybody knew they were going to be around. And they wouldn't buy them at two times earnings. And that's when interest rates were 2.5%. You know, I went to the, I started selling securities when I was 21. And a Kansas City Life Insurance Company happened to be a fairly prominent company in Omaha. And the policies they sold you, if you were buying life insurance from them, had a built-in assumption of 2% interest. The stock of Kansas City Life was selling at less than three times earnings. You were getting 35% if you bought the stock. No question about the soundness of the company. I went to the local agent. I thought, I figured, hell, I ought to be able to sell him a few shares of stock. I mean, the guy ought to understand it. He's got his whole life invested in this company. I went to the local agent who'd been with him for 20 years, and his, his name was Moose. And I said, Mr. Moose, I said, you know, you're selling these policies with 2%. You may even have a few members of your own family, and you can buy into this company whose paycheck you depend on every month and, you, and whose future you, your, your beneficiaries of these life policies depend on and who you're selling them, you know, a 2% investment on, and you can get 35% on your money. He said, you know, stocks aren't any good. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't sell you, you know, I was a lousy salesman. I mean, well, you have to start with that. But, but uh, it, it just blew me away. It blew me away. I thought, sometimes I used to wonder if I was nuts, you know. And, uh, but those things, the same thing happened. I mean, in 1964, the Dow closed at 8, 864. At the end of 1981, 17 years later, it closed at 865. It moved one point in 17 years. Now, that's not a big move. And... That, you, you can't believe the, how, how discouraged people were by that, by, during that period. But, you know, people were living better. But, uh, so, things can go on a long time that don't make sense. And, but they do come to an end. I mean, the internet thing. I mean, you had these companies selling for many billions of dollars that had no, really, practically no prospects of making any money. That, that's, a, that's a bubble. But Herb Stein one time said, anything that can't go on forever will end. <laughs> now that seems pretty, uh, but think about that. And uh, particularly think about it next time you're trying to do something just because the stock's gone up a whole lot, you know, and your neighbor's made money or something. It, uh, you've got to be, you just have to sit and think objectively and, and think about, would I buy this whole business? If it's an internet company, it's got 100 million shares out and selling at 100, that's $10 billion. Is it worth $10 billion? If it's worth $10 billion, it's got to be able to give you, you know, seven or eight hundred million next year. And if it doesn't give you seven or eight hundred million next year, <clears throat> it has to give you maybe 10% more than that the year after and continue to be. There aren't a lot of businesses that can do that. And people just go crazy. And of course, it's fun. I mean, it's, you know, it's like that sign they, they put in brokerage offices that says, avoid hangovers, stay drunk. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> it's, it's just so much fun to keep playing. But uh, you got you to do sensible things to get, to get good results.